Okay? To complete the task of, that Jesus gave us in the world, addition and church as usual is not going to cut it. We have to seek the fulfillment of the Great Commission by multiplying disciples like Jesus modeled for us. We're here because we're seeking for the kingdom to come, the kingdom of God to come on earth through the multiplication of followers of Jesus. So, so Ray talked about, I hope you caught this, that you know, within the, the stories of Jesus and the life of Jesus, he had an entry strategy. He had a, a strategy for demonstrating and communicating the good news of Jesus. He had a strategy for starting to, to, uh, to disciple people. And he had a strategy or, or a rhythm for gathering people together who repeatedly wanted people's homes. Throughout this week, we're going to touch on these four fields that Ray touched on. And I'm going to give kind of a different lens of the same information. And my hope is that by the time you, you leave here this week, that you have this grid for creating multiplication movements in your respective cultural context. But at first, I want to tell you a story about how I began implementing the four fields or what I'm going to present to you as the four rhythms of multiplication movements. So in 2007, I started just dreaming with God about what it would look like to get out of just bringing people into a big meeting uh, to hear me preach or hear another preacher preach and get into people's homes, to get into their apartments, to get into different campuses and to start making disciples, gathering them into groups and then training up leaders from those groups to go out in pairs to multiply groups around the city. And um, I first started trying to implement it within you know, my church structure, but it went really poorly and I quickly realized that in order to not um, destroy the old wineskin, I had to go and create new wineskins for God to pour out His Holy Spirit in. And so one of the first places um, that I went was a Native American reservation. I won't tell a long story of how I got there, but it was the last place I ever would have thought about going. But one day I was driving by this Native American university and I just suddenly felt this enormous compassion. And oftentimes in answering, you know, Ray uh, uh, gave us the grid of wanting disciples to answer four questions, the who, the uh, where, the what, and the how. Oftentimes in answering who do we go to, I find that there's a rhythm that, um, that precedes that. And it's a rhythm of prayer. And if you look at your sheet, um, Prayer is the first rhythm of multiplication movements. So I was praying, God, where are you going to send me to? Where do you want me to go? Where do you want me to go? And as I was praying, one day I see this, this Native American university and I feel this compassion well up inside me. And so I feel like, man, maybe I should just move into the next rhythm. I should go there. And that's what I believe Ray is referring to as the entry strategy. And so I decided to move from a rhythm of prayer into putting my feet on the ground and I start walking around the campus. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the cultural context here because I've traveled around for the last three years telling this story and it's been a narrative backdrop for everything I, I do as I travel. But in the history of uh, the Euro-American, the, the European colonialization, um, you know, Europeans come to America and when um, the, the first year Americans came, we encountered these native peoples. And the story in general kind of went like this. Hi, we're here from Europe. We're fleeing religious persecution. God sent us here. We're starving. Can you help us? And the native Americans said, gladly, we'll help you. We're sh we'll share what we have. We'll give you crops. We'll teach you how to farm. We'll teach you how to fish. And the Native Americans started off with good relationships with uh, the Euro-Americans. Euro but then as more and more Europeans came, the, the story went like this. Well, we're still coming from Europe. God sent us here, but we need more land. And the natives kind of said, well, we'll fight you a little bit, but then we'll move farther inland. And so the natives moved farther inland. Then over the centuries, um, more and more fighting started happening. And again, I'm summarizing a few hundred years of history, but then the story evolved uh, to look like this. 
Um, okay, we're fighting you, and we're starting to win these battles, uh, but uh, we've, t we've pushed you out of your homeland, but we're going to build these reservations for you. And um, we're going to put you into this reservation land, and then we'll leave you alone. We'll allow you to, um, you know, to, to, to follow your ways, and we won't fight you anymore. And then we would, the Euro-Americans, uh, Americans at this point, sorry, so the Europeans are excused at this point, now it's just the American sin. <laughs> we would sign treaties with the natives, but then we would um, discover oftentimes there were gold, there was gold and natural resources in areas where um, that we had formed treaties with them, so then we would break the treaty and reduce the size of their land and then renegotiate a treaty with them. Um, in the midst of this, though, the story wasn't done because missionaries started coming to the First Nations people or the Native Americans. And then the story went like this. Okay, we have lied to you. We have broken treaties with you. We have fought you, but... We're here with good news. The same God that sent us here to you from Europe, we're here to um, teach you about this God. And so the missionaries would build um, a church, or they called it a mission station at the edge of the reservation. And then they would say, as long as you will cut your hair and you will learn our language and you will change how you dress, you too can come into our buildings and learn about the God who inspired us with manifest destiny to come here to you. Now, for some bizarre reason, this mission strategy didn't work. And so as I was learning this story, I began to question in my own life, in my own way of bringing Jesus to people, what is it that I do in the presentation of Jesus that turns the good news into bad news? What is it I, I take that is of my culture and I say, you have to adopt my cultural way before you experience my Jesus that basically puts up such a high barrier that kills the movement of the gospel. Well, let, me, let me just pose this question to you. What? That's an extreme story. I remember in the midst of learning this story, I walked into a, a natural history museum and I saw a picture of Native American children on a reservation dressed up in gray, uh, you know, English looking suits and their hair is cut and they're sitting in rows and they're staring at the camera with frowns on their faces, but next to the picture is a letter written from a missionary to her financial donors in New England, and in the letter it says, thank you for your support, praise God, look how we have Christianized the Indians. Now that's an extreme example, but what are things you can think of that we do today that maybe isn't all that dissimilar to that mission strategy that turned the good news into bad news. What are some things you can think of that we do today in our presentation of what church is, what the gospel is? What are some things you can think of? We're going to do worship in the... Say again? We're going to do worship, especially deal with the guitar and that. Okay. And that's good pop tunes. Okay. <laughs> worship forms. <laughs> Okay, if you will learn our songs, you can worship God like us. I remember one time I was doing a training and people weren't getting it. It was a, a group of Christians and so I said, all right, all right, this, this idea popped in my head. I go, I was doing a week long training. Sometimes I do a one day intensive, sometimes I'll do like a seven day interactive training where we'll live out these four fields or I call them the four rhythms. We live out the four rhythms experientially and then debrief each day how we're living out that rhythm. It's really fun. You can see churches planted in a week. Um, but people weren't getting it. And so I said, all right, I want you to go out tonight for two hours and I want you to find a gay bar, a homosexual bar. And, uh, and I want you to go hang out there. And so uh, a couple of people are like, well, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to like, you know, preach the gospel or heal sick people? I was like, well, if that happens naturally, of course, but mostly I just want you to go there and hang out 
and then come back and tell me tell me what happened. So they went and did it. Most of them did. Some of them chickened out, but they went out and they found this like nightclub, gay bar, and came back and um, I said, "So how'd it go?" And they're like, "Well, it was okay." And I was like, "Well, what did you experience? What did you feel?" And you know, uh, they started giving feedback, and the feedback sounded like this. Well, it was kind of awkward. I said, well, why? They said, well, we've never been to a place like that before. And, you know, I walked in and, like, there were people smiling at me and coming up and greeting me and wanting to talk. And there was music playing that I'd never heard before. And, you know, like, I, I didn't know if, like, people wanted something from me, you know, or trying to get something from me. It was just really awkward. And I said, that's great! Now you know exactly how most people feel when you invite them to church. <laughs> you see, what if bringing the way of Jesus to people was less about getting people out of where they're, they're comfortable into a place that we're comfortable, but they're not? And it was more about the Jesus entry strategy of getting into the places and the spaces where they're comfortable but we're not and finding out how Jesus is working there and planting Jesus there. Another, another one of those kind of contextual things, worship forms, I, I would say would be Bible forms. Okay, in what way? So, often when Christians meet to have a Bible study, whether it's in their house or somewhere else, mm -hmm. everybody kind of goes quiet. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of read the story and then people do a lot of discussion uh -huh. about it and they usually bring in all of the things that they've ever heard about anything, mm -hmm. ever. Yeah, okay. Whereas the kind of people that we've seen weeks to are not church. The Bible studies tend to be quite chaotic. People don't all go silent. And, they, it, and, and also, some, sometimes as well, um, a lot of Christians are readers. And a lot of the people that we reach are not readers, so we yeah. say, you know, if you want to read it, mm -hmm. and they can't, and they're not comfortable okay. reading. Yeah. And some of the people that we met, they actually get more from the Bible stories when it's more like um, you're you're reading it dramatically. Yeah. You know, so, um, so actually, so it's still short discovery Bible studies. Okay. Instead of just reading it like the right. kind of Dawa kind of Christian okay. way. You, so you're talking you about the forms more. of Bible learning. Yeah, the, uh, there's a there's a very Christian way of doing that. Yeah. Even with the kind of reading the scripture and asking the questions that right. often don't match the people. Okay. What else comes to mind? In like in that similar to that using that native story as a parable or an, or an analogy. What are some things you can think of that we t do today in Christendom that turn the good news into bad news or make it harder for people to access the way access the way of Jesus? We, are, so sorry, yeah. uh, we, we assume that class differences don't matter mm -hmm. in a country where class differences are, if not everything, certainly very important. Okay. So, okay. for instance, inviting a, oh, I don't know, uh, I live in East London. I got you. Inviting someone in uh, a Cockney, uh, you know, working blue collar type, to my local England church, where everyone is white, upwardly mobile, certainly the middle, not upper middle class, and speaks with a semi posh accent. Okay. It's an assumption that it's not a big deal. There's great coffee and tea, and it's kind of cool and good music. They'll just they'll do fine. Okay. I'm going to call that. Correct me if this is not adequately describing this, but not respecting social groupings. Yeah. So people, we go. Okay. Here's how they are. These these are people who already know each other. But we're going to have church over here, and we're going to try to chop up all their social groupings and get them into this place, church. And that actually slows down the indigenous spread of the gospel among people. Does that get what you're getting at? Pretty much, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, what else can you think of? The way of doing prayer. Okay. In what way? Well, it just depends on what in the church background the Christians come from who are doing pioneering. Okay. Okay. It's not, you know, when you let go with. Well, what we found is when people then go and most of the people into their house or something, the way you do prayer, um, might be a lot simpler and a lot more yes. short, 
straightforward. Yeah. I love praying. I love, I love teaching people to talk to God who've never talked to him before. And it's like, you know, I, was, I led this one native young man to the Lord and he's praying and, and he goes, at the end, he's like, all right, that's it, God. I'll talk to you later. You know, <laughs> you know, know you're supposed to say amen at the end. It's beautiful. What about, what about the forms? Let's, let's get into thinking about the forms of church. You know, I assume we're all, you know, you know, not, it's not an assumption we're all here to multiply movements, but what in terms about the way we gather, the way we express church can actually slow down the multiplication of the gospel? I know, like, in Houston, I mean, our main mode right now is playing churches in houses. Mm -hmm. I know in Houston, the African-American community is oftentimes not willing to open up their house for home. Uh -huh. Some of them are. Yeah. And so just being aware that it may not, houses doesn't necessarily even work everywhere. Nice. Okay. All right. This is a big thing in the UK as well, okay. because uh, often uh, the middle class people who are in churches, they're out doing a demanding job in the daytime. So their home is their kind of castle to keep to at the end of a hard day at work. But then when we're meeting and meeting people who are un, uh, that are not working, they actually want to get out of the house, not be in the house. Nice. Okay. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I've, yeah. I've seen this in the house church movement, that sometimes in a reaction to uh, institutional church, the same almost like ecclesial idolatry about houses happens mm -hmm. as if, as if like there's something magical about the home, you know, you know, I, I thought of this phrase yesterday, but um, whining and new wine don't go together very well. Whining and new wine don't go to don't mix very well. So if you're like wanting new wine movements, but you have a whining spirit about the way church should not be, they just don't mix very well. So I'm going to say this. Um, uh, how would you describe that? Um, uh, the, the location. location. Legalistic commitment. Le legalistic to one form of church. And place. Or container. Of place. Place for church. Okay? Like, for example, the man we met in the pub last night, we might be insisting that it's going back to his house that's going to start the church. Whereas actually it might be at the actual pub itself. Right, right. Okay, awesome. Okay, any other last example come to mind? Maybe language as well. Some, I guess, some of the culture that we've been brought up with, that like Christian language that mm -hmm. doesn't compete with, you know, working with fellowship and other things like that, which just don't make sense. Okay. Christianese, yeah. you call that in the States. Yeah. Okay. Sure. It's where you start to hang out with a Christian subculture, and anytime you're in a subculture, you develop language forms within that subculture that. Um, cease to communicate meaning to the, the other cultures. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right, cool. All right, time for stories, I promise. Okay, so here I am in this situation, um, moving from a prayer rhythm into an entry strategy, or what I call a go rhythm. I didn't know what else to do. I felt very awkward. I felt out of place. But I decided if I would just put my feet on the ground and actually talk to people and get to know people, maybe something would happen. So I start walking on this campus. I start spending uh, uh, two to three days a week there just walking, praying, and then I made it a goal to talk to five people each day. That's it. I wasn't even like, at this point, like planting the gospel. I was just timid and afraid and trying to move from a cultural outsider to an insider. Here's something I want you to pick up that came up in our sticky notes. I was, from the very beginning of implementing this strategy, I was not out to make, get people to make decisions for Christ. We're not called to lead people to decisions. We're called to lead people to be disciples. In order to make disciples, I realized I couldn't just go in and do like, you know, quick pray this prayer. Go meet someone on the street. I decided my entry strategy would be going to the same places and the same spaces and engaging the same people over and over and over again. So 
as time goes on, a few weeks go by, one day I'm in this, um, I'm in this dormitory. I've met probably 20 or 30 people on campus by this time. I've been there maybe, you know, eight to 10 days. And this teacher or counselor comes up to me and she says, what are you doing here? I've seen you around campus. And I started to get nervous, you know, like, oh my gosh, she's gonna kick me out. I'm not supposed to be here. And before I can think of anything to say, these words pop out of my mouth. I said, well, ma'am, this might sound weird, but um, I'm a follower of Jesus. And the Spirit of God came on me, and He sent me here to heal brokenhearted people and to bring hope to those who uh, are hopeless and to proclaim that now is the time of God's favor for the First Nations people, for whoever will accept my message. And then at the time, I was like, I can't believe I just said that. Like It sounded like you know messianic complex or something. But this, this teacher looks at me, and she goes, Wow, this is fascinating. Would you come teach one of my classes? <laughs> she said, what do you want me to teach on? She goes, would you teach on spirituality? I teach a, a, a class every week for freshmen um, on setting goals and vision for their life. And I said, well, ma'am, um, I'm aware that the history of like Christianity among the First Nations people hasn't been so favorable most of the time. But I would teach from the perspective that um, the person of Jesus um, the way he loved and the power that he had to set people free from, from evil forces and, and harmful things in their life. When Jesus rose from the dead, I believe it's that same power that lives inside me that inspires me to love people like Jesus did. And she goes, that would be amazing. Would you come teach on that? She's not, she was not a Christian. So I go into this, this classroom and I start moving into the third rhythm of going from a prayer rhythm to a go rhythm to watching where are people gathering. I start going into the dorms where people gather. I start going into the cafeteria. I get invited into a gathering in the classroom. I go into the classroom and I teach for 20 minutes. And all I did was simply tell my story in language that I, tr I believe was appropriate to them by saying, oftentimes the tragedies of life give us hopelessness. See, in the Native American communities across uh, the states, uh, the average life expectancy um, for a Native American male, my stats are correct, last I read is 42 years old. Average life expectancy for a male. The suicide rate for teens, teenagers, is five times the national average. The poorest, most unreached people groups in the entire United States are the first people who were engaged by missionaries. To me, as an American, it seems like a travesty that the first people to live in the land I call home are the least percentage of people following Jesus. And I believe that God want, is raising up a movement in the U.S. where the first in the nation will become the last to lead. And those who were the least will become the greatest. And the native people are sleeping giants. Today there are over 510 federally recognized Native American tribes who are nations within the United States nation. And so in this classroom, as I've moved into the third rhythm of gathering, I just talked about how Jesus wants to bring hope. God is not far away. He's actually close. He has a future, a good plan, for, a good purpose for your life. And then as I looked around the room, I saw that four people were crying. And so after the class, I just decided I could keep up moving from this gathering rhythm into a guiding rhythm. And so these four students, I said, you know, I love talking with you. What are your names? And I said, you seem really interested in spiritual things. Would you like to get a meal and talk some more? They said, sure. So from this classroom, I started meeting with people in the cafeteria. And the teacher comes up to me after this class and she says, that was awesome, would you come teach again? So a couple weeks later I taught again. I ended up coming back three times that semester and at the end of that semester she said, you're really good at this. I think you need to teach your own class. And eventually I was taken to meet with the president of the university, again, someone who is not a Christian, and she interviews me and for some reason I felt like I should bring my family. I didn't know why, but so I bring my wife and my my children in 
And I find out later that basically what was happening was I was going through protocol with Native American leadership. Where I was actually, you know, like Jesus talked about in Luke 10, you know, an entry strategy is to look for people to welcome you. Before I started anything, all I was doing was praying and going and then looking to be welcomed into gatherings. The counselor was a person of peace. The president was a, was a person of peace. I ended up meeting this other Native American couple who were followers of Jesus. And they uh, looked at me and they said, what, what, what are you doing? You know, we've, we've heard about you. Tell us your story. Tell them my story. You know, how I, I left. I'll just, I'll just be honest. Sometimes people ask me if I'm a Christian. And my response to them is, that depends. You tell me what you mean by Christian, and then I will tell you if I am that. So for many Native peoples, Christianity is a bad word. And so among the Native populations, I communicate at times that I had to leave Christianity in order to follow Jesus to you and bring the way of Jesus to you. Now, I'm on my Christ uh, yes, I am a Christian. But when I say that, what I mean, see, again, we're back to language here. If Christianity is this, I'm not going to say I am that. But I am a follower of the way of Jesus. And I want to bring that to you as good news. So here I am meeting with the president. And she welcomes me onto the land and says, I'm glad you're here to mentor students. And, you know, she's just using whatever language she can use to describe what I'm here to do. I get a handout of every single student at the university and their dorm room. And I'm told, do whatever God sent you here to do. One day I meet with this, uh, this, uh, that other native couple. and They look at me and they say, you know, Eric, we don't trust many white people. Because every year white people come to the land and they do their crusades and they get people to raise hands and pray prayers. And then they write the newsletters home about, look what God did. And then they leave. But we see that you're different and you walk in a different spirit and God has truly sent you to live among us and walk among us. It's our custom to honor those God sends to us and we would like to adopt you into our tribe. Six months later, I was adopted into the Dakota Sioux Nation and I was given a native name. And it was just one of the just coolest honors for me to move from an outsider to be honored and welcomed as a follower of the way of Jesus and be included and embraced as now an insider. So here I am. All I'm doing, I haven't, I haven't started a church. All I've done is start to model the rhythms that I see of Jesus. To pray, to go to a place and a people, to find gatherings and have conversations and gather together with them. Then I move into the cafeteria and we start discussing stories about Jesus. Many of the native peoples were oral people. So even though they've learned to read and write, they're much more comfortable with using language like, hey, can I tell you a story? Sure. Well, Jesus told a story about there was a shepherd and he had a hundred sheep. And sheep were very valuable in those days. But one of them got lost. And there were wolves around and dangers. But the shepherd, because he loved the one so much, he left all the 99 and to risk going after saving the one. Why would he do that? And then, why do you think? And then, you know, we talk about it. Well, that shepherd must have really loved that one sheep. Well, why would the shepherd do that? You know, and discuss about this. And then, well, what does that tell us? If Jesus is telling us that story about what God is like, how do you see God pursuing you? And then, you know, so we would talk about the stories orally. And then people would start to discover that they actually like hearing stories about Jesus. I want you to pray. And I want you to identify where is Jesus wanting to go that he's sending you ahead of him to go um, gather with people and guide them in the way of following Jesus. So he prays and he gets this one dormitory on his heart. It was called Osceola Keokuk Hall, or OK Hall for short. Now this dorm was known as a really dark place where you could go in at night and you could smell incense burning from people um, trying to cleanse their room of demonic spirits because they were tormented by nightmares. 
So native, native, these people were not asking, how do I get to heaven when I die? They're asking, how do I get rid of these evil forces that come into my room and torment me? One counselor in that dorm told me that in a previous uh, semester or year, one guy had impregnated five different women. Now the interesting thing is that you could go into that dorm lobby and you could see all these advertisements and flyers posted on the bulletin board inviting people to church. But you couldn't find people modeling the way of Jesus to go bring the light where the darkness was. Until this young native disciple says, I've prayed and now Jesus wants me to go there. So he gets a brilliant idea. He gets a box of donuts and a jug of milk. And using some of the tools I've taught him about, read a Jesus story and just discuss how does this encourage you? What do you see about Jesus? He goes in and he uh, starts hanging out with, with some students. He sees some people he knows from his classes. And they're like, what are you doing here? And he's like, well, I've recently started um, having experiences with Jesus. And I felt like I was supposed to come here and just share what I've been learning with, with people. I brought some donuts. Would you like to sit down and discuss a story about Jesus? It'll take maybe 15 or 20 minutes. And so like three people said, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll do that. So they sit down, they eat the donuts, they drink some milk, and they listen to a story about Jesus. And, and, and he asks, what do you see about Jesus in this story? And um, what do you see about people? And how does this encourage you? And at the end of this discussion, he says, do you guys like meeting and discussing stories about Jesus and they said yeah we do so he goes when would you like to meet again and he goes how about Thursday that was a couple days later so a couple days later they met again and a few more students started gathering to, to, to discuss and discover Jesus together after about three weeks this little group forms and one night this native man comes in and he's all tatted up and very traditional looking and he just kind of stares at them at the from the edge of the dorm lobby and, and he's scowling at them and they see him and they said, hey, would you like to sit down with us? And he comes over and he goes, is this like a God thing? And they're like, well, yeah, we're discussing stories about Jesus and how he has supernatural power to transform our lives. And he goes, okay, I think I need something like this. And he sits down. So again, all they're doing is reading a story about Jesus over a meal or snacks and talking about it. Well, during this one gathering, this, the atmosphere was pretty enthusiastic and people are having lively discussion. And after a while, this, this native man says, can I tell you a story? I said, sure. He says, well, back with my tribe and my family, we don't do Christianity because Christianity to us is a bad word. Christianity lied to us stole land from us, broke treaties, and decimated our families. But the reason I'm here is because last night I had a dream. And in my dream, I was back with my tribe, and we were dancing around the fire. We were dressed up in our native regalia, our native ceremonial clothing, and we were worshiping the Great Spirit. But as we danced, a stranger appeared among us. He was dressed up like my people, but he had the face of Satan. And as he danced with us, he was pointing fingers at us and mocking us. But in my dream, I was the only one who could see him. And then I woke up full of fear and I felt like God sent me this dream, but I don't know what it means. And I heard about this group gathering here to discuss things about God. And I felt I should listen. And this disciple, this rhythm maker, this rhythm maker, rhythm maker, Jesus rhythm maker says, I can interpret your dream. God sent you a message that he's called you to be a deliverer for your people. Have you ever heard the story of Jesus? And he says, no. You know, there are many, many people, I would even venture to say in post-Christendom Western world, most people have heard about Christianity without hearing the story of Jesus. The way of Jesus. And so this rhythm maker explains the way of Jesus. Jesus is God's sent messenger for the world. Early on in the history of, of people, God, God made everything. He made people. 
But this evil being came in and deceived the first people and it broke our relationship with God. And evil and sin came into the world and warfare and rape and murder and violence and evil all came from this brokenness, this separation from God. But God is so good and He loved people so much that He didn't want people to live in this brokenness from Him and brokenness from each other forever. So He sent Jesus and Jesus loved like no one had ever loved. He cast out demons. He had authority over evil spirits. He healed sick people. And He taught people how to come into a restored relationship with the Creator. But evil people came and they killed Him. Although He was perfect, evil people killed Him. But He was so powerful that He didn't stay dead. He came back to life. And the same power that raised him from the dead, he came to his followers and he put that power within them and he told them to go all over the world and tell all the tribes of the earth how they could be restored from their brokenness back into an intimacy with God the Creator both in this life and forever in eternity. And he's restored, he started a movement that is restoring the tribes of the earth into relationship with one another and relationship with Creator in heaven. This young man looks at him and goes, that's what Jesus is doing? Can I join Him? That night he goes through the first guiding experience. And he goes through what I call the change experience. Where he changes from being centered on life after I'm my God and changes into being centered on following Jesus. Starting with receiving the new intimacy with the Father by receiving the forgiveness of Jesus' sacrifice. Short time later, he goes out with three carloads of students and he goes through the second experience, the water experience. Many of those students weren't yet following Jesus and the story of what happened to this man spread through the entire dormitory, spread through the entire football team, all because one disciple says, I want to replicate the rhythms. And a short time later, as this group formed, church started happening in this dorm. As other people became centered on following Jesus, they started learning the basics of what Jesus commanded and how to love each other, how to give. One night, a guy comes in who was a new follower of Jesus and his shoes were falling off his feet. And they said, wow, Jesus wants us to, to give Let's collect money for our brother. And they collected money and they went out and bought him shoes. And everywhere he went with his new shoes, he said, look what my Jesus family bought me. It's kind of rumored that if you're part of this community of Jesus followers, like they'll take care of you. They'll know you're my disciples by your love for one another. I want to tell one more story to just kind of um, paint a narrative backdrop these, um, these rhythms. But... Another one of the first disciples that I ever made there was named Bear. Bear's actually coming with me this next week. I'll be back at Haskell uh, this next week. And Bear hears the story of Jesus and he goes through the change experience. Gets baptized with his friend. Goes, th you know, goes through the water experience. We then go to Bear and say, hey... Jesus wants to give you power to be a witness for Him. Would you want gifts from the Holy Spirit? He says, of course. So, Bear goes through what I call in the pocket disciple the fire experience. John the Baptist said about Jesus, He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And actually, Bear helped me name this experience because he goes, man, you got to name it the fire experience because, you know, just earth symbols and languages were important and there was a precedent in scripture so we called it the fire experience pretty soon I told Bear um, alright now that um, you've gone through the change experience the water experience and the fire experience the next experience you need to build a habit of is the um, tell experience and I just taught Bear how to tell his story with his friends he didn't need much coaching because he just honestly just wanted to tell everything that moved about Jesus and so one day he comes to me he'd also been learning about um, after the fire experience, how Jesus has power to heal. He's learning that the Holy Spirit is powerful. 